ranging because of the height problem. <laughs> um, how are you this morning? You're good. Um, you know, we're all born and we're all given a name. Some of us don't like our names. Some of us have well-planned names. Um, my name means a honeybee, and it's a Greek name. Whether my name was before Melissa became a modern name, I don't know how it changed, um, but I prefer my name Melissa to Melissa. And some people are given traditional names in my husband's family. Everybody is Christian, and all the girls are Susanna Hendrina. So my husband is named after his one grandfather, and I decided I'm not doing the same. So my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, well, they weren't very happy with me, because first of all, I chose English names and not Afrikaans names. But when I was pregnant, I really thought about, what am I going to name this child? And I had quite a few names, and I said to Andrew, this name or that name, and all he said was, no, no, no. I said, OK. That's fine, you're not proactive, I'll do it myself. And whatever name I choose now is going to be the name of our children. You have now handed over all control to me. So I did some research, being the person I am, and I came up with, if it's a girl, our first child will be Amy, it means beloved, and her second name will be Jade, meaning precious stone. If it's a boy, it will be Joshua, John. Joshua, I loved being strong, and because my dad died when I was 20, I wanted to leave my son with a second name of being John. So lo and behold, our first baby is Amy, and I meet her, and she's this fat little fat baby, and I look at her and I say, you're an Amy, you're going to be an Amy. And when I was pregnant with the second baby, if it was a girl, it was going to be Aaron, and if it was a boy, it was going to be Jared. So lo and behold, you saw my son this morning, he became Jared, which means son of and strength, and John being one of the disciples. So I was happy with the choices I made because I really didn't want to call my daughter Susanna Hendrina, and my son Christian, which his dad's second name is Christian, but I thought I wanted to be the person to choose my children's identity. I didn't have the choice of choosing my name, my name was Melissa Smith, Paul Smith, and my poor brother has got the name of John Smith, which is not really nice, you know. Everybody is John Smith. But this poor guy has got the identity of my brother is John Smith. But I was really privileged, and so was my Andres, and our children were brought up in church. So I was privileged to go to Sunday school. I loved Sunday school. I started Sunday school at four, my first teacher was Miss Lillian, and I loved her to bits. So I loved Sunday school, and I grew up in a, child, in a Christian church, and I had identity, and I knew how I was. But the South Africans, who they are, we don't just do birth certificates and passports. No, we do an identity book as well. So just in case you don't know who you are, they give you a book and it's called an identity book, and you get your number. So the first six digits of the number is the, the year you were born, the month, and the date. So my first numbers were 66 11 So that was my identity number. I was given identity number, I think at 16, when we got our loaner's license, and that number stayed with you for life. But now, and you got your photograph in it, and when you got your driver's license, your driver's license was stamped in your ID book, and any other criminal offense was stamped in your ID book. But if you lose your identity book, you basically lost your identity, because in South Africa, a driver's license and a passport can be fraudulently redone. Cheap, no problem. So they don't trust your driver's license and your passport if you go pick up an, a parcel at the post office. But being the good old South Africans, they know how to work slowly. So if you lose your ID book and you go to the police station and you say, I've lost my identity book, they take your ID number, and then, that, then you have to go to the Department of Home Affairs, stand in the queue at the Department of Home Affairs, and hopefully you get a nice person to tell them you've lost your ID book. Maybe, <laughs> if you're lucky, a month is really fast. Three months is normally when you get your ID book back. So within the three months, 
period, you cannot really hopefully get a, a speeding ticket driving a car. You can't open up an electricity account. You can't get a bank loan. You can't open a bank account. You can basically do nothing because you have no identity. You can take your family with you to the police station and sign an affidavit. Nobody's going to believe you without having an identity book. So you have no ID. You have your name, but nobody can believe you. You can be fraudulent about it and um, have no ID at all. So that happened to me a few times. I lost my ID book three times. They were all stolen out of my handbags. My handbags was ripped off my body or taken away when you're not looking. Your handbag, they open up your handbag in South Africa really quietly in the shop. So you're doing your shopping and somebody opens up your handbag, takes your whole wallet out, and there goes your ID book with you. So your life is gone. So you can't, do you get to the shopping till, which has happened to me, my whole monthly shop is done, and I've got no, I've got no wallet. I've got no bank card, I've got no nothing. And you, what you have to do, you say, I can't pay for these groceries. The checkout lady hates you, because she has to unpack the groceries back on the, cupboard, on the shelves because you have no ID book. So you're gone, there's nothing there. So you have no identity. And that often made me think when I didn't have an identity, it really, really bothered me. Because I lost who I was. I knew I was a wife. I knew I was a woman. But I didn't really know who I was. I had no identity. I lost that for the three months. It's weird because you always need your ID book. Like in Australia, you need your work, you've got to work in this children's check or your driver's license. And you even go pick up a parcel at the post office. They want to see your driver's license. If you, you don't have that, what do you do to say, I am who I am? Because nobody will believe you. I mean, the person behind the checkout counter doesn't know you from a bar of soap. So how will they believe you that you are who you are? And often, you know, we can stand in a mirror. I've got two mirrors here representing two things. So this mirror over here represents how we see ourselves. And I said this morning in the earlier sermon, I hate the mirror in the lift. I don't know if anybody's looked at that mirror in the lift. That mirror is worse than Snow White because it shows up everything that's bad. I've never seen wrinkles I've seen before. I've never seen the cellulite that I've seen before. I've never seen myself look so old like I look in that mirror. And I often don't take that lift, I walk the stairs. If I walk in that lift, I turn my back and I don't look at that mirror. Because sometimes I don't like what I see in that mirror. Because it shows me how tired I am, how old I am. And I don't like it. I like looking in a mirror and seeing, oh, I look nice today. You know, I'm not overweight. You know, I don't look so bad for my, my, my age at the moment because I got eight hours sleep last night. But you know, sometimes we look okay, I look all right. You know, I'm not graying, I must profess, I'll tell you publicly, I'm 50, almost 53 and I don't gray. So I can't tell you the product of hair color I use because I'm not graying yet. So I hold one trump card in my life that I'm not graying yet. But you know, you look in the mirror and you think to yourself, I don't look so bad today. But then you look deeper in the mirror and you think, oh, Hold on, something's worrying me. I don't look so nice. You almost take like an onion. You know when you peel an onion, you go from layer to layer and layer and eventually you get that little piece of onion left. If we take the layers and the layers off, we actually see some things we don't like. Oh, the lie I told my husband the money I drew out of the bank account to do something else, I don't like it. I've told a lie, it's showing. Or I'm really nervous, I'm insecure, I don't know who I am, I've got an eating disorder. When I was 14 years old, I broke the, the, the bathroom scale because at 14 years old, I was weighing 39 kilograms and not 35. And I hated myself because I weighed 39 kilograms at four foot 11, and I wanted to weigh 35 kilograms like I did when I was in year eight. So I broke the bathroom scale in my home. That much I hated myself 
because I want you to be a little thin twig of a girl. Now, naturally, I'm not a twig. My father was this big rugby player man, and I've inherited his physique. I could never be skinny. I could never be maybe 35 kilograms again. But I got to be such, I got to hate myself so much that I climbed on a family scale and I jumped on it till I broke it, that I didn't have to weigh myself anymore. I mean, I don't weigh 35 kilograms, I don't want to weigh 39 kilograms, it's too thin. But the fact of the matter is I got to such a bad stage that I didn't know who I was. And through that, I had self-doubt, I hated myself, I didn't want to be, I wanted to be a thin girl like the covers, like the Vogue and the, the, the model figures on the cover page. I wanted to be like them. I didn't like myself because my mother had told me I wasn't intelligent enough. So I decided I'd label, label myself dumb. So every time I walked into this mirror, I saw a dumb girl. So what did I do? I stopped studying in high school. I didn't work at high school. I didn't study at high school. I played the fool in high school. I got into detentions at high school. I didn't want to study because what was the point of studying? Nobody saw any good in me. And then in year 12, I thought, oh my goodness me, I better pass year 12 because I don't want my mother to say, I told you so. So I took six years of studying into one year. I did pass year 12, but I didn't get any distinctions. I just made it. God got me through that year 12 because I looked at myself and I saw I was worthless. We have children at the age of five at the moment that are being seen with psychologists for um, depression. Children at the age of five are depressed already. And also, children have eating disorders at the age of five. So how bad is the identity that a five-year-old child is seeing a psychologist? Guys, can I ask you at the back, children, sorry. Keanu, can you keep the children at the back a little bit quiet for me, please? Thank you. So children at the age of five are being depressed and have eating disorders. So how bad is that in our world today? When they look in front of that mirror, what do they see themselves at age five? They should be playing in the sand. They should be playing in the mud. They should be getting dirty. They shouldn't be worrying about eating disorders or emotional problems. They should be free. I mean, when I was small, I was thrown outside at the, to play at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we came back at 5 in the afternoon. We played outside, we built tents with, with um, what do we use, curtains for tents, and we played outside. We were happy children. We had no real problem with identity, but today's world, it's changing. People are looking at themselves in that mirror, and they're becoming more and more depressed, and they're seeing such bad things. Last year, I was lucky enough to go to America, and I visited with my daughter who was studying in Boston, and she just commented on the competitiveness of the students at university. How they're competing to get into an a, internship, you know, bad-mouthing the other one to get the position, the competition to study to be the highest. Nobody must be better than them. They must see themselves in the mirror and be the best that there is. And we were able to relate and discuss how the Australian way of thinking in university is so much different. Because in America, in that particular university, it was a cutthroat kind of environment where everybody has to outdo everybody else. So you can imagine those, and I saw those university students. I was lucky enough to live in the campus for how many? Four nights? And I said to Amy, I feel so old, Amy, in this university. And she made my day, she said, Mom, they think you're a professor. So, oh, I tell you, I walked around with my head held high. I loved those four nights living in the dormitories with her because I thought they think I'm a professor. But you did see them walking in the suits and, and how the competition is so rife then. You're thinking these kids are 18, 19, 20 years old and they're really having identity crisis. They're really in competition with each other. Man, when I was 18 and 19, I was a TAFE having a wonderful time, not worrying about life too much. You know, and in, the, in our society today, it's really, really not that good. So this mirror often will represent 
destruction. How we see ourselves is not always healthy. I mean, I often have looked in the mirror over the years. I only really liked myself at the age of 40, where I looked in the mirror and I actually thought, you're not too bad, Melissa. You have some things to offer this world. I battled with self-confidence and inner self-confidence for many, many years. People have said to me, I would never have thought you were not confident because I just was on my defensive. But inside, my husband will know. He will know because he met me when I was 22 and he has walked the road with me. He has given me lots of affirmation because I never got affirmation ever. I didn't know what affirmation was. I only thought of I'd get affirmation if I'm naughty or if I do something wrong, will I get something. And when I looked at that mirror, I never even really liked myself. You know, even I don't even like having photographs of myself because I didn't really like myself because I didn't like what I saw. But then we look at the, this white mirror and this represents Jesus, or how God sees us, how Jesus sees us. He sees me, praise the Lord, I'm hoping six foot. I've always wanted to be six foot. I don't know why, but I've always wanted to look at my husband eye to eye. You know, he often looks down at me and I have to look up at him. No matter how high my shoes are going to be, I'm never going to be six foot. But Jesus sees me very, very differently. He, he knows my identity. He knows who I am. It's me being able to see myself in the mirror like Jesus sees me. And confirming that I have my identity in him. Get rid of that mirror. That mirror is no good. It's, not, it's useless, because the mirror that we should be concentrating is Jesus. How, how does Jesus see us? How does God see us? The Bible says we are co-heirs with Christ. We are God's offspring. So why am I worried that I don't look good in that mirror, where I should be worried about how do I look in this mirror? Because that's the mirror I should be concentrating on, looking good knowing my identity is firm with Christ. And I don't have to waver to go look at that mirror because that's like Snow White's mirror. You know the story of Snow White when she calls out mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest in this world or this land? And the mirror cries out, you are the fairest in this land. But the mirror's only calling out that the mirror doesn't actually get crumbled or, or thrashed or whatever it is. But we look at the mirror here in Jesus and Jesus is saying, but your co is with me. You are God's child. Why worry about that mirror where you can worry about how you look in this mirror? Where is your identity? So we have a purpose because our identity is in Christ. This mirror is reflecting that. It's reflecting me as a child of God, a servant of God, that I can serve Christ no matter how good to my best ability that I can do that. And the reading this morning is all about sheep. And a few years ago, I used to work for Swiss people many years ago, and on one of their trips to Australia, look, these Swiss friends that I worked for, they make friends with everybody. So on a boat in Sydney, they make friends with these um, exclusive sheep farmers, this lady wanted to say. She's an exclusive sheep farmer, and she lives out in Kilmore, I think, it was Kilmore. And she invited my Swiss friends to bring us to their sheep farm out in Kilmore. And off we go. I don't really like, I mean, I like the farm, but personally, I don't like shoveling up horse poo and walking with, you know, in the farm. I'm not really a farm person. So I said, okay, we'll take you to this sheep farm in Kilmore, hoping that I don't have to do any farming activities, you know? Um, and we go and this lady tells us all about this exclusive sheep that they're breeding. And the only difference is that they had a black face. And they were quite nice looking sheep. I think they're Leicester sheep or Leicestershire sheep or whatever. And she was telling us how much work these sheep are. But in the conversation, she said, look, sheep are dumb. And most of us know sheep are really stupid, aren't they? Um, she said we have to feed them a special food if we give them any other food, they'll eat it, but then they'll get really sick. And then it's high vet bills, because the vet's got to come and basically clean their gut and else put them or euthanize them. So they've got to make sure that the food that they feed these sheep are actually 
is the right food with the right nutrients in the food, um, that the sheep get fat, um, what you call organically, um, no steroids in the food, no nothing. So these food can get fat and they can be sold. But she said, we can't just leave them out in the paddock. They've have, they had a, a whole range of um, quad bikes. They would have dogs. They've got alpacas to keep the foxes out. But then you can't befriend the alpaca because then he's useless. So I was told not to go and say hello to the alpacas because they become, they're useless. So she's got all of these things in control in order to make sure that the sheep don't do anything stupid and they also then survive. So she said, as Melbourne does, the rains open up and you've got to get the sheep in. So then they've got to jump on the quad bikes, get the dogs out, get the sheep all rounded up, get them into the big pen and let them stay covered because they can't let the sheep fend for themselves. They can't do that. So she had a 24-hour job, her and her husband and the farm manager, because these sheep were really valuable to her. And if one sheep dies, well, it's a couple of thousand dollars per sheep. So if you let 10 sheep die, you're down twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for a couple of sheep. So she made sure that those sheep were well looked after. And Jesus is saying, basically, we are really stupid humans. And I don't mind saying I'm stupid because in a way, I'm totally dependent on God. He's my shepherd, I'm the sheep. He knows how to shepherd me in the right way. He knows to protect me and care for me because my friends that are the sheep farmers, they want the best for their sheep. So the outcome is the best outcome. So I don't mind being a sheep. I actually quite think they're quite cute, you know. <laughs> they smell, but they're quite cute. But I like being known that I'm, Jesus, I'm one of Jesus' sheep. I'm the shepherd sheep. Because this lady that looks after the sheep, she actually has an affection for those sheep. She actually likes those sheep. She rounds them up. She corrals them up. She loves those sheep. And so, so does Jesus do the same thing. He loves me. He keeps me in line. When often, if I've done something to offend somebody, he really lets me know I've offended somebody because my body goes all weird. And I know I've done something wrong, and I have to go say I'm sorry. Often I have to say to God, I've done something wrong. But you know, I'm esteemed in God. I have an identity in God. He loves me so much, and I love to be affirmed by God. I love being affirmed. I love it when my husband will send me a text and tells me he loves me in the day. I love it. I love it when my children send me texts. I won't tell you what he calls me, because that might just end the marriage. Because we've got the best marriage, you see, according to me. But I love it when I get a text from friends or somewhere else saying, Hi, Melissa, how are you? Or you did a really good job. I love being affirmed. We're all affirmed. I love affirming my children and those that I know very well. Because everybody likes to be esteemed somehow. And Jesus esteems us. He affirms us and he loves us. Um, I don't know if you know about a gentleman, a well-known evangelist. His name is Timothy Keller. He's written many, many books. And he relayed a story in one of the podcasts that I listened to that when he was a young university student, he's got a number of degrees and he was studying at something, and he went to a talk held by a really well-known professor. And he listened to the talk and he loved the talk and he shook the professor's hand when he left that particular talk and said to the professor, you know, my name is Timothy and I really liked what I heard. I was really oh. blessed with what I heard. Years later, Timothy heard that this professor was coming back and he went to the lecture and after the lecture, he came up to the professor and he shook his hand and the professor said to him, and he said to the professor, do you know me? And the professor said, yes, I do. Your name's Timothy. And I want to go have a soda with you to catch up with you of what all you've been doing. 
Well, Timothy nearly fainted. I mean, seriously, if I went up to this, I love Beth Moore. She's this great um, American Bible evangelist. And if she said to me, I remember your name, I think I would have fainted dead on the spot, you know? I would have had the first eight people coming to do CPR on me. But the fact of the matter is, Timothy, rem this professor remembered Timothy. He esteemed Timothy. And Timothy went and had a soda. That's what the American, that's the, the wording he said. They had a soda and they caught up. But Timothy said, it wasn't the catching up that was so fantastic. It was the affirmation and being esteemed by this professor. That this professor actually took time to remember Timothy's name and want to spend time with him. Now Jesus does the same thing. He remembers us by name. He wants to spend time with us. And he wants to affirm you. And in life, we can do the same thing. We can mentor somebody, we can affirm somebody, we can esteem somebody, and we can, and we can travel with them. And I think that's a great practice to have. We have so many older people in our church, and we have younger people in our church, and we can do the same thing. We can affirm, we can mentor, we can esteem um, somebody else. But you know, it's when we become... A Christian so we become we go from the old to the new for example when we are baptized we walk into that water professing that we're the old person and when once we've been dunked in the water and baptized we come out we are a new person we don't look any different we don't look more beautiful we don't look any slimmer I wish that sometimes that could happen but we don't but inside it's that internal that changes. The Holy Spirit comes upon us because we've done something in the step of obedience. We're believing that our identity is no longer in ourselves, but we have a new identity, and that's in Christ. So from that day onwards, we're a new person. We have a new identity. Forget the old identity number. We have a new identity in Christ. And I really want to encourage you that if you don't have an identity in Christ, just to get a new identity in Christ, to believe in God, because that relationship with Christ will change your life. It's a life changer. Yes, there's ups and downs like any other journey in life, but it's the best journey you're ever going to have. And at the end of the journey, when Christ calls you home, you're going to go be with him, and you're going to be a co-heir with Christ. To me, there's nothing better in life. I've done the old way, I've done my own way, and each time I've done my own way, I've hit a brick wall. But each time I walk with Christ and do a Christ's way, I always come out better for it at the end of the day. And just to finish our service, um, I'd like to read from Acts 17, verse 28. And it says, for in, him, for in him we live and we move and we exist. So we exist in Christ, we live in Christ and we are in Christ. And as some of our poets have even said, we are his offspring. So we're God's children. He has made us in his likeness, and we can rejoice knowing that and taking that promise with us for the rest of our lives. Um, I'm going to invite the band up, and I'm just going to pray while the band comes up. Can I invite you to pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, we celebrate that we have an identity in Christ and in you, we can get rid of the old mirror and we can just look in the new mirror. And when we look in that new mirror, we can just see your face shining on us and smiling on us and saying, I love you, my child. You are mine. You are mine to keep. And isn't that just a wonderful promise, knowing that we are yours and that we are your offspring? So, Father God, we ask you to come in and come in our lives and wash us anew. And as we finish the service with the most wonderful song about reckless love, may you just love us with everything and may we love you with all that we have and all of our being because we are in you, in your most precious name. Amen.